what was the stage that you, at what point did you think you wanted to be a writer mm. and you felt like that was something that, that, that you could do that felt, felt possible? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I, I did a creative writing course at university, which not all in those days, not, they weren't that few at universities. And I'm a fan of uh, writing courses because I think, you know, anywhere that's a forum where you can have your work taken seriously and get given some deadlines is good. And if that's more informal with a friend or group of friends or a colleague or semi, you know, professional or pre-professional when you're thinking about getting into the industry, if you can find somewhere to someone to write for who you know is going to read with interest and a sort of, you know, good critical faculties, but also humane and it's not going to crush you that that relationship can be really great and I got a bit of that a taste of that writing prose in a university creative writing course but I think you know any course or forum where someone's going to read your stuff um, is really useful because one of the great challenges about all start, all stages of writing but especially at the beginning is sort of taking yourself seriously and making it feel important that you finish you know this piece of work not just drift off to the next idea or like the idea of your the idea of yourself as a writer but actually do it and have some stuff that you can show someone else if if needs be yeah and I imagine that sense of sort of accountability and deadlines and having to deliver something because it's very easy to procrastinate yeah yeah I imagine that's helpful yeah um and is to what extent have you um been consciously sort of curating your career as a writer like have you been thinking you know as you as you've gone from project to project do you think about yourself as being a particular kind of writer and wanting to be a particular kind of writer do you think of sort of personal brand and does that come you know if, if we can use that horrible phrase but uh-huh. does that sort of come into it as you no not, not not I think this is actually the first moment in my whole career when I maybe I would have would think about that because um Really, you know, means I did creative writing at university, came across Sam Bain, who was also at university with me, who I wrote Peep Show with. And after we we left university and he he worked doing vaguely literary kind of he got got, he got some work adjacent to film and TV and stuff. And I was very much sort of just working in restaurants and, you know, painting and decorating anything as soon as we started writing together. And then got an agent, which is a great, you know, at that point, and I think to a certain extent still is a, you know, a a gatekeeping role that it's really useful to pass through and get yourself an agent. Um, Once we entered that slightly more professional sphere, our our aim was always just to earn enough money to be professional writers. And so um, we learned a great deal from from working on kids TV, which we did on my parents are aliens and Queens knows old, old, old kids shows now. And, um, uh, uh, and Tracy Beaker, but the main thing we were doing was just taking any gig that would pay us money so that we could carry on doing those projects, but also our, 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 our own stuff. Um, so yeah, I would, uh, it's a, it's an interesting balance, right? There are probably some people who would sit here and say, just do your own stuff. Like, fuck everything else it's got to be your stuff and and then everything else will waste your time and that is true to an extent some people you can drift off and suddenly find oh I've been writing for this sort of show or in this milieu that wasn't what I really intended and that can be great because you've earned a living being a creative person or you can have some regrets and it's like oh I never really did my show my thing I don't think there's a perfect answer to that question. It's per- some personalities are suited to only ever doing their own stuff. Um, uh, Chris Morris, who I did the, we wrote for on Four Lions, is that kind of auteur who would never really probably do an episode of The Queen's Nose or write links for techno games, the Robot Wars, and like these money jobs that me and Sam did. And there are other people who do, who, who you know, a lot of people learn their craft like you know, Sally Wainwright and Russell T Davies working on um, continuing dramas on soap operas and other, you know, things where you can earn a wage um, while you learn. And, you know, you mentioned uh, Chris Morris and Armando Iannucci is another uh, sort of great creative that you've worked with. Um, Were you thinking at all about kind of mentorship and who are those people you might be able to learn from and that might be able to sort of shape you into a writer? Or were you just thinking, I just need to work and we will work on whatever and whoever 
gives us gives us jobs yeah we were very much of the of the latter like whoever gives us a job we would learn from and then if you're lucky you start um meeting people who you respect and think oh that's if i ever got to be doing your job that's how i would like to do it and uh i'm ando chris like that and we worked with danny boyle on um a cop show sort of cop show sort of office show called babylon and yeah he was he when you see someone like that work and the way he works with actors the way he works with a casting director you you start to realize there's big differences right that that name director or also even more so producer can cover a multitude of ways of interacting with your writers your producers your your all your creative collaborators and the ones who uh, do it in a way which you think is really good for the project and also i think good as a human being start to appeal to you can you think of anything that you particularly learned from, you know, whether it's Danny or Armando or, or, or Chris that you thought that has really, you know, wh- whether it's when you came to be sort of running your own shows or at that time that really sort of stuck with you? Yeah, I guess they got all, they're all really different human beings and personalities and you don't have to be any sort of personality to be a writer or a director. There are some who are, you know, socially confident in the moment and are able to hold the room and, be that sort of boss person and there are others who want to retreat to behind the camera and are not the sort of person who want to naturally hold a room and the same goes for writers there's people in my in writers rooms I've worked with who are who don't like pitching to the room in that in a very public way and they'd rather listen and then contribute by email or um, in their in their drafts the the key quality for on I guess I I think about directors because they're the people who are whose skill set I don't have and I'm most often collaborating with and what I love about working with Armando and Chris I was less there on the shoot of um, Four Lions so I've seen him actually shooting a little bit less but they both and this maybe comes from my background in comedy is they're very alive to capturing the precise moment at which something good is happening and and you know you people who've made shorts and bigger pieces will know you start with this feeling about maybe what you want to capture what you want to do and then you start hiring the cameras and working with your people who you're very grateful to get them whether you're paying them or not to work with and you get this architecture and then there's the schedule and it all becomes even at relatively small scale it becomes very um it's a sort of bureaucracy and the sort of politics around it and the call sheet and there's this architecture which is quite nice because it makes you feel like hey I'm actually making something I mean this is a real film like other people make and what and that's all good but you, you can lose the bit of it which is none of that matters all that matters is what you capture uh, on in the sound and on that frame and on that day and if you can keep alive to capturing the moments which are happening and forget all the architecture around it and the job titles and um, the peripheral stuff. If you can just remember, we must get the good stuff and it doesn't matter how we do it, um, at what part of the day or whether we're meant to be rolling or if we're not meant to be rolling or just get that over there. I love that feeling of, of slightly guerrilla slightly light on your feet, slightly comedy. You might be capturing a moment of tragedy that's happening over there, but I think people who come from comedy, in my experience, are particularly alive to the to, to capturing those little moments. But yeah, I think very much structure, 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 structure. That's the toughest part, I think, of our jobs as writers and the whole part of the whole creative endeavor that everyone who do, do the other jobs that people do in this room or, or want to do. Um, um, structure is everything, in my opinion, in that you can't have a joke unless you have a structure, right? You know, the most, you know, the old, the most, every joke begins with the structure doctor doctor okay we're in the doctor's office the the, the, they, the frame of a joke is here's the situation and now something can happen maybe you can have the wildest surreal comedy 
without structure, but even that is playing with structure. So you can have surrealism, you can't have it without structure. So creating structure is everything, and that's the toughest thing in the room. Um, usually, if you've got a creative group of people, you will find something funny, but finding out the logic behind the story that will keep your audience interested is the tough bit. And in a, I often think about the the, the jokes, the, those beats as the like the eggs that you get once you've built a, a, a nest. And the nest is the, the the show itself, creating a tone like Succession and the characters, and then oh. This is the business deal that's happening this week. This is the conflict between these characters. And then you build, and this is the room in which it's happening. And this is the pressure. This person's hungry. This person's in love with the person. And now you've got a little nest. And if you know enough stuff, in a way, you, you, you are kind about my joke writing abilities. And we, I work really hard on it. And we do read throughs, a number of read throughs. And, and then the edit helps you to weed out the, the bad jokes. But in some ways, you shouldn't have to work too hard to get that final joke if you've created a situation that will at least be interesting, even if it's not funny, of, of one person who's in love with the other person, the other person's only thinking about the croissant. Not the best scene, but it could work. <laughs>tone the tone of a show and the tone of a show like succession is everything in fact all, almost all pieces all sh short films long films are in some ways i i would say um pieces of tone right the tone of such brave girls versus the tone of i don't know catastrophe and 30 rock the that that showness of them is the the is the most important thing that you could try and bring as a as a writer. I know what sort of show this is. And so when I first went to meet Armando about the thick of it, he had like some audition with him and Peter Capaldi and they were just messing around, but he gave, he had that frantic quality and the um, aggressive, anyway, the tone would be, it's brilliant if as a screenwriter, you can bring that to the, to the piece. Um, you might end up doing it in collaboration with the producer and director and you might all create the tone because the director has a, a strong vision that can help you and so i guess rhythm is a subset of tone so once you've set up the the tone of a show like um the thick of it which shares some qualities in a way with with succession that there's quite a lot of high pressure people in rooms arguing you you your rhythm becomes the the actors become attuned to that rhythm and so the, the rhythm is there inherent you don't then on a smaller technical level the the you should be able to hear the line in your head how you think it should go. Usually the actor will pick up on it or make it better. Very occasionally you think they've got the rhythm wrong. That I think that's one of the toughest notes to give in film and TV. Are, I hear it like this and I think it should be like that because often those things are so internal that if you, you know, it's considered something of a faux pas to give an actor a line read this is how I think you should say it understandably because that's I think they understandably feel a bit like all right back off mate <laughs> this is this is that's you're in my my area now but it should be inherent to a certain degree in the line if you find yourself thinking they're doing it wrong you can gently try to have that conversation but at a certain point I think you should have to step back and say I should have cast the right person who was going to be in the right area. Maybe I've miscast and it's too late. Or maybe, guess what, it, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. But then you hopefully you have a colleague and you go, does this sound wrong? And they're like, no, it sounds great to me. And you realise, you know what, that was just part of the many letting goes that have to happen on set with a, with a writer. You know, the room doesn't look like you thought it would look. Doesn't matter. They're saying it's slightly different. Doesn't matter. There's hundreds of things that don't matter. And then there's a few things which really, really do matter. And if they're wrong, you need to intervene and have relationships, which mean you can intervene um, in a way which will be accepted and part of a useful conversation. Yeah, it's a good question. I think if I had... I, I, if I was talking to actors, I would say to try not... not to do that wholesale changing of 
lots of lines or lots of stuff maybe you you could have a conversation early on with a writer and say i like this part i like this but i feel this is wrong about the way in which it's written for these reasons and and maybe we could work but together if if things changed but the, i think part of the contract between you know as you put together a film or a tv show is this is what we think it is the creative whether it's the director producer write, writer is obviously my perspective and then do you want to come to this creative party um, uh, and if you do, broadly speaking, you're going to do the lines. This, this is this is what this is. Can, can you change change your line here because it doesn't feel natural to you, rhythm wise, or you've spotted a little logic problem, or you don't know why am I saying I'm hungry? I was eating in the last scene. It doesn't make sense. Stuff like that is all fine. But just like I want to do it different is a bit of I would say personally as a professional like, huh. Uh, I, I, I might mention this to my fellow showrunner. Like that actor, like just comes in and says they don't want to do it like that. <laughs> like, fine, but I need to know quite a lot more. And I, and I, yeah, I'd have a little reaction to that. Uh, we on on Succession and the thick of it, and I've done a ton of things, especially comedies where there's improvisation. So, you you would get the the, the scene as written and quite pretty close to what's written, because um, usually you know the writer's written it for a reason, and that's why you prickle when you when people want to change things a lot, but. If you're in that improvisational process and that's part of the show or the spirit of the endeavor, then great. When when the moment comes to do that, go you know bring bring that stuff to the to the party. Uh, and, and indeed, because our our show is improvisational, if on a take something ex extra gets thrown in, that's fine. I'm relaxed about that sort of thing. I'm not going to be like, oh, you didn't do that comma and you added an extra clause in there. If it's in the spirit of the piece. I think that's that's all to the good. Oh, thank you. Well, I, I think what the you can't do it all just once, right? You if you adhere over a few days to listening to different people, I, I imagine you might feel some moments of creative inspiration, and then you can feel overwhelmed because people like me say you need to do this, and then someone else says you need to do that, you need to do this. It's like I need to do twelve things. It's too much. You at a certain point you have to relax and just do your thing and develop because we aren't and none of us have finished articles at any point and you're learning all the time. So that is a health warning about don't get too stressed out. But I would, <laughs> but I do also feel that if you are asking for people's attention with a film or a TV show, sure, it's a, increasingly in the world, right, that attention is an incredibly valuable commodity and do not waste it like if you've got a story to tell or a thing or an emotion to transmit it's really it's really a um this sounds maybe a bit wanky or highfalutin but it's an honor to have people's attention for that time so don't waste it and therefore put as much into it as you can what is the most and this it might be just what's the most interesting thing i can show you about what i think for me, this is the area that I'm interested in, how people interrelate. What what can I show you? And I, I I like, I'm from the world of comedy. Other people might be from the world of like horror or psychology. I, hopefully I'm in psychology, but psychological thriller or, or different areas of human experience. I, I tend towards, I think, human conflict, but in these kind of oh, bureaucratic structures. Uh, that, uh, so... I like comedy so that what I would love in a line is for it to be human, real, maybe tell you about something of this world that we're in that might be the police, might be politics, might be uh, media, family, um, and have an ambition that every line could be fascinating because of the way the, pe the words that people use, right? It, language is inherently interesting. The sort, it tells us so much about someone's... Uh, background what they're and how they uh, particularly how they want to portray themselves versus uh and maybe natural v vocabulary in it or the way they code shift between different spaces depend depending on the audience they're talking to so i love the texture of language can it can it be funny or not even funny funny but have that twist of of uh what you might call comic, even in a tragic or horror or other situation. So 
it, it once you realize how much you could tell about a situation and a person and a relationship in a line of dialogue then you can get a sort of feeling of vertigo of like wow you can put so much in there um and you can't think about that as you're doing every single line, but eventually you can maybe go back your, over your script and go, actually, maybe this can go, this can go, this can go, but maybe this can get richer. That doesn't mean longer or more complicated. Often it, it can be taking away more. Can we trust the audience more? Will they, that's very thrilling for an audience. You put less and less and less in, and they're watching for clues more and more and more of faces uh, uh, and uh, other clues they're given onto what's happening. Uh, on the, you know, you, probably most people know that TV and film are a little bit different. In I was a showrunner in, especially American TV, you, you're you're the the central creative voice in a way that in films the director is. So if I was working in a film, I would expect Chris or Armando to be the voice, and you might they might ask my advice or not, depending on the moment or the and the situation. On a, on a TV show like Succession, I would I would um, be heavily involved in all the bigger parts and at least watch an okay every single part in the show and um and every you know it's a sort of cliche that every part is a big part when that when that person is on screen but it's really true you know you i've occasionally waved a, a, a small part through and then on the day that moment rests on that actor who's only maybe got a line in the show but it might be quite important dynamic to to make work so every part can be a can be a big part and we've had a number of roles in succession which started out as rather smaller more peripheral and because of the dramatic dynamic but also the quality of the actor it grows and grows and grows so if there's i think if you're thinking often actors will have a feeling of like i'll do any work that's around but if you if you if you're choosing if you get to collaborate with people who you respect and like their work, even I would do a smaller piece of work with somebody who I found interesting and I might get to work with again over something which was, if, you, if you're lucky enough to be in that, that, that position. Um, and tips, you, you're probably better to ask actors. We watch, a, there are a lot of, since COVID, but also because it's easier for, probably for producers and casting directors, there's more and more self-tapes. I think that's very tough on people. I think it would be nice to come to a room and have a dialogue there is also, but there is an advantage for people in my position that you get to watch more. It, it's worth think. I'm afraid it is worth thinking about the technical uh, quality of your uh, recording that the sound is okay and the the um, the technical aspects are good. Um, uh, and and then uh, what else do I think? And then it's worth trying it a few different ways. You know, we watch we watch tapes, we watch we watch different performances. I'm aware that what an actor is doing is them in isolation. They haven't seen the whole script. They don't know the whole story. There may be radically different ways of playing a scene, and I don't mind. I, I don't mind people playing and and and, and showing one a, a range of, of stuff that you can you can do. That's a very specific situation that I, you know, I can't talk to the specifics. I guess I would say I feel for you, and I think you know, you if you can find any supportive collaborators to make your work, then you can be protected a bit from from the people who are less supportive uh, around. Um, in general, I guess I would say on a creative level right this isn't per on a, on a personal human day-to-day -day level you need to protect yourself and protect the group that you make something so personal with I, in terms of like my public advice to anyone in a situation thinking about that i think you have to decide what you think about the world who you are what you're comfortable with saying and then you have to say fuck it this is what i want to do this is what i want to put out there i think this is true and right and i could if i was talking to a friend i could defend the position of this if you if i'm thinking about controversial material and i have confidence in what i think i i know that some people might disagree with me and i'm gonna this is going to be my creative expression of where i 
am on this topic. Um, I, I, I think that if you do something with a good degree of thought, then a lot of 90% of the audience, maybe more, will meet you in that place of good faith it's some controversial topics. There's going to be some people who are going to be on a different side of the argument who you're never going to reach. Um, but in my experience, most people respond, especially when you start show that the 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 human um, part of uh, any story, uh, and people respond to that. And, and it's a, that's one of the great things about what we do is that you can show people a, lot, a great variety of experiences through through stories. Good. I think that's a nice compliment. I'm not sure I have great advice about it. It's one of those, you know, there's a lot in the room we can talk about and there's a lot which is just how you work, how, you're, how you write. Um, there isn't a percentage that, that, that I think the only thing to say about it is that I, we do a, I do a lot of work and we do a lot of work. It doesn't come naturally, right? All, uh, I think all the script, yeah, this is, I think all the episodes of Succession are good. Uh, and, you yeah. know, there's some that are better than others. But they weren't, a couple of them came more easily, but most of them have gone through a stage where they were bad. They were like, we do a re if we read, did a read through in this room, you might go away going, I like that and I like that, but it kind of didn't really work, did it? Every, every project will go, go through that moment of not working and it doesn't mean that the project itself is not good or what couldn't be good. Um, it just means that you haven't got there yet and... At that point, you need to apply your brain and maybe some friendly colleagues or people you can talk it through with about why didn't that work? You know, we were so sure that that, that, that area would be of interest to people and that conflict should be in. Why doesn't, why could, you can feel it in a room. That's why if you're actors and you can help your writer or director friends and do read throughs and if you're writers and directors, if you can encourage your actor friends to help you out and just read the script in hand super casual you don't need to put too much effort into it it's incredible how quickly it becomes apparent what's working and what isn't working rhythmically in the, how boring or interesting it is the jokes you will feel it and it's a slightly undeniable feeling even though you would like to deny it when it isn't working sometimes somebody might be hideously miscast and it's just like well that that's just not how we're going to do it but but you will feel a great deal from hearing your scripts read so that's something to do quite early on if you've got a trusted group who aren't going to decide that you're a moron just because you did one half hour read through that didn't work. Well, I think anything can work as a writer. If you find a way that works, go with it. It doesn't, there's no rule. I was working, I've been doing a little tiny bit of work with a brilliant writer, Alice Birch, who, um, uh, Lady Macbeth, and she just did uh, Dead Ringers, and she, people might know her theatre work. Um, uh, uh, I'm probably forgetting her most famous credit. And she did um, Normal People. She did the adaptation of, with Sally Rooney. And Rooney's. Conversation with Friends. And Conversation with Friends. So she's brilliant. And uh, we were just talking about how we do it which is what often writers, we don't know how other people do it. And she has a list of 500 questions that she asks her characters. I don't know if it, maybe people have heard that advice. Um, and that's her. That's really important for her and it builds up those people. I, I, I come a little bit more from the... I don't need that. I just don't need that. I don't need any of that. I, I think I'm a little bit more... Um, I was going to say Marxist, but it's not quite the word. Sort of, uh, but or maybe it's capitalist. I'm uh, the the position that someone's relationship to the world and often their job tells me a lot. Maybe that's kind of some of the shows that I've written on, right? People who know Succession, Greg is like an underling guy, and and in a certain way, that is his character. He's like an underling guy, and it in, in it, it, it informs everything. And Logan Roy is the patriarch the dad of the family and he is a patriarchal monster and he's the boss and that is his character and maybe it's a deficiency of the way I think about people but there's I think about people a little bit mechanically and then guess what it's fascinating because we aren't all just cogs in a wheel who 
are precisely where we fit in the machine of an economy or indeed the machine of how a family works with a strong mum or a strong dad and a you're the third child with a brilliant brother or sister who takes the limelight so therefore you have to act like this but I th I tend to think of those quite um, mechanical ways into a character and then all the other stuff about like Alice needs to know whether how often they have sex and what whether they know who Miley Cyrus is or not like those are some of her questions she asks her characters I don't need to know that I, I'm happy in the scene if it's funny that they are know exactly who Miley Cyrus is that's fine and if they if it seems funny they don't I can live with both those things they're not important for me but it, it is important for Alice so I think you have to find your own ways into a character but they can be multiple the the thing you do need is like a they wouldn't do that you, know, you need to know some they wouldn't do that they would do that things but your way of getting there fine if you if you want to put Mark Ruffalo's picture up or Michaela Coles and it's like it's that they're going to be that in my head and that'll do because I can now I can write the character then that's great so uh just on a technical level we, I would tend to not know really what was going to happen in another season because guess what in tv you might always get cancelled and you might not you know that may never happen so we would tend i would and also creatively i think it's too much to try and plan the whole season for me um so i would just try and get to the end of the next season so when we went into the room for season three we would plot season three and not worry too much about what happened next however ours is a particular show if you're doing a different kind of show, a sci-fi show or a, I don't know, ghost story or a world, a world where there's a mystery to be resolved, I think that you maybe need to know where you're going because I guess what I know, no, I didn't know necessarily who's going to win, but I know the tone. I know that this isn't a triumphal show about he fucking did it and he's going to be the best CEO in the world. Like, you go and do it, dude. It's not that show. So I know where the tone is going to be. So... I did decide quite a bit earlier that I thought it should be the person who eventually wins. I won't say that if there are a couple of people who haven't seen the show, but but I knew what the tone would be. So if it if it had been another character, it would have been similarly contingent and grubby and unsatisfying to them in that kind of um, hooray, you've won the game. Because I guess the show is a bit about the game being bullshit and terrifying and destroying of people's humanity so I think it's legitimate for me not to know the precise ending because I know the tone and that's not going to blow it I'm not going to reveal oh guess what they were all ghosts so none of that mattered like that would not be a satisfying ending but for so 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 I think some shows you do need to know a bit more than I needed to know um uh but but then I would try and do it but but then if you were say so you do if you know the big reveal at the end is they're in heaven or they're in hell if it's just, you know that kind of show uh, then you can then you can play with the arc and, and in this season we will find out this amount of information about the world building that we've been doing or that this character there's a terrible reversal and they're not what they seemed or or, or something um i know you've got loads 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 more questions um but we are almost out of time um so i think perhaps jesse is there anything um any other sort of nuggets of wisdom you can leave us with? I don't Anything know. I want to. Can... What's the? Um, what's the? What, yeah, I always. I've just. I, I'm pleased to see everyone. I wish you well with your work. Yeah, I, I just want to give you as much as I possibly can. I don't know. I can't. It's impossible to tell what the most pressing remaining question is. I guess. Yeah. What is the most pressing remaining question? Who's got the most pressing remaining question? <laughs> 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 what's the most? What's the most difficult to imagine area? I guess the. Uh, I, I would say. Uh, you um the two things are equally important to remember it's really 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 hard it's almost impossible to do the really brilliant thing and yet you can't think about that and all you've all you've got to do is go to your desk or your camera to do your um audition or you know read the script that you might direct and put one foot in one in front of the other that's something that occasionally would uh, be told to me when I was in the midst of succession and 
incredibly anxious about coming up with the ending of the show that might work for people and 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 you know you're you're trying to rewrite episode three and yet you have this looming thing and you know if you don't stick the landing as they say the whole show may feel phony and bad to people but you can't think about that you can't you can't you can't there's no way that a human brain can do all of that work so all you can do is look at the scene you've got in front of you and try and make it as brilliant as possible um, you won't be doing that every morning other mornings you'll be trying to feel what the whole shape of the show is that you have to do all as one piece but I guess you can console yourselves that you can't do everything at once and some days you'll be thinking about maybe I could write a western that's never I've never liked westerns but I think I could see a way that would do tell something about it or or a big tonal thought but then then you have to go to your desk and write scene one of woman walks into a bar in the west and like i'll just try and make the next line as good as possible and as real and interesting so you've got to hold those two things in your head right you can't do aim for something amazing which is the thing that only you can do but don't be so terrified of of getting there that you don't get up each day or when you're able to work and do the next little tiny step which will get you there in the end yeah careers are careers are a marathon not a not a sprint <laughs> Um, thank you, Jesse. That was fantastic. Thank you all for your brilliant questions. And I'm so sorry we didn't get through all of them, but I hope there was enough there that, that you found really interesting and useful. And the show writing panel tomorrow, I now know, is Martha Hiller, Rebecca Roughton, Camille Shah, and Bindu Distopani. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, 11 o'clock tomorrow. So hopefully they'll, you'll, you can go and ask all of your remaining questions of them. Jesse, thank you so much. Thank you, Rowan. Thank you. Good luck.